lose time Beyond time and space A pleasure Forever I look for your face Beyond time and space Forever We're lost in pleasure I'm Colin Dangard and welcome back to the Colin Dangard Show With me is my great writing partner Ed Wagner He's unbelievable, this guy We started writing what is it now, Ed, 30 years ago? At least, 1989. And you met me when I was on a horse in the rain. Well, this is a story. I was at uh, Michael Landon's house just visiting um, back at Bonzo in Malibu. I was trying to become a writer. I was in an arena. I bought my boots. I had my English saddle. And then I just went in circles. And it wasn't too exciting. I didn't know any, there was anything else. And I came out of this, out of the driveway, onto the street, and out of the mountain came this guy. Now, this is a rainy day. This was not a normal sunny day in Malibu. It was raining. He was covered in mud. He had a knife, a bull whip. He didn't have a helmet on. He had just had a hat dripping in water, kind of bent over. And I went, that is the real writer. That's what I want to be. There's nothing I want to do. Anything else, that's what I want to be. Pulled up next to him, rolled that window down, tried to talk to him. He was very gruff. <laughs> I asked him if maybe he could show me. No, I don't teach. Um, if there's any way I could do anything. No. And he just goes, boom, 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 looking down, not looking at me. But I did get his phone number, and so I kept bugging him and bugging him. And one day, he said, okay, meet me on the corner of Rainsford and Bonzo. Now, this is just a cross street of a simple street. I arrived there, <clears throat> had my English boots, English boots on. Um, I thought I was the way I was supposed to be. I said, well, what do we do? He says, just follow me. <laughs> well... <laughs> That's the first lesson. There was no words. And we start hauling down the street in people's front yards, going over their fences, over their driveways. And then we hit the back of the canyon, and he takes off. And there's a giant gully, probably five foot. I had never even been on a, a gully. I didn't even know what it was. He just goes right over it. And so my horse followed. Now, luckily, I had an incredible Arab who was highly agile, but... I didn't understand horses. And we got back, and I go, oh, my God, in an hour and a half, we probably did 10 miles. Or, that's my, my thought, whether it was or not. We never slowed down. And I didn't fall. And I think that meant everything. I didn't whine. I didn't fall. And from that day on, I was allowed to ride with Colin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was... That was uh... The start of something magnificent for me because uh, I like to ride hard. I I, um, I enjoy the horse enormously. And uh, one thing about the horse is when you get on it, you can have all kind of thoughts and worries of the day. You've had a bad day and something went, something went wrong and you missed the mortgage payment again and it's pretty glum. And But uh, you get on a horse, open it up, find a yeah. steep hill and go down it all day. Guarantee you won't think of anything else at that moment. <laughs> That's right. And the key to healing is to get out of your mind. Uh, think about it. That's what we do in my office. That's what I, I try to... I do treatments to get the people out of their mind, get them in their spirit, into their heart. Well, nothing does it better than a horse. So I remember my first... Uh, on another ride with him, the first time we were coming down... Um, a fire road, big fire road. Maybe it's a couple miles long from Castro Peak down. Except when we're down a quarter of a mile, he doesn't stay in the fire road. He just goes over the edge. And I said, to me, it's a cliff. And what are you doing, Colin? What are you doing? And he doesn't either doesn't answer or he says, follow me. Or he gives a hand signal. That's his style. <laughs> so I just follow him, went right over the edge. And then there's no trail. This is rugged. This is bushes. This is rocks. Gosh, what a feeling. 
I can't think of anything else in my entire life. No problems, no nothing, because it's survival in a sense. And that feeling of being totally clear, you end up realizing, you end up memorizing it. And you, if you experience um, no stress for a moment, mental stress, might be physical, but no mental stress, then you remember that. And I doubt if there's very many people ever, I had never experienced it, where I was completely separate from my reality and my world. And that is the real state of living. Yeah, well, I noticed uh, in the many years now that we've been writing together, and I've, uh, I used to... I used to delight in finding something steeper and more nasty to scare the hell out of you, but now you scare the hell out of me <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I, I taught him too well. <laughs> well, I was always on his tail, and then uh, the one day it changed was Colin asked me to go riding, but not in moonlight. It was so dark that literally at 15 to 20 feet, I could not see him. All I could do was hear him. And he's in a dead run. So imagine, pitch black, you can't see the ground. I can hear him. And I at that time totally trusted him. And so if he did it, it must be safe. A little foolish on my part, but uh, <laughs> that's what I did. And I remember I left my fear and I told my horse, take him. And that horse just blasted, and we passed him in the midnight. Pitch black. I didn't even see him when I passed by it, but I could hear him. That changed me forever. And I think at that moment was the first moment where I became like Colin. That a lot of fear left me. And I got to enjoy the horse and feel the horse, how it was healing me. And I understood the horse from that day on. Yeah, that's... Interesting. I've often thought about your job. Ed, Ed of course, is one of the uh, a, a famous, well-known, worldwide chiropractor, and he's a, a healer, a genuine healer. I've seen him heal lots of animals, and including me, just by touching me. It's really fascinating. His hands are just beautiful. Um, but I've often talked to you. I remember we had these conversations out in the trail. I said... And I get the, I'm getting the idea why you like this horse stuff, uh, because uh, all every day you spend with people, and you the way you cure them is you take their illnesses from their body into your body. So by the end of the day, you have all of this angst within your body, but you get on the horse, and I can see it. I can actually see it happening in your face. Mm. It all melts away very quickly, mm -hmm. all that anxiety you had about all the people you've been trying to fix up and get right. And um, so uh, I started to understand why you, you're so passionate about riding horses. And you are. You I mean, you'd ride every day if you could. Yes. And uh, it's, uh, time is just ma making a living seems to interfere with your... Uh, endless drive to ride a horse. <laughs> I can yes. see that. <laughs> well, healing is, there are people who are mechanical healers, there's nutritionists, there's all kinds of type of things. But there's another level, which very few people attain, and he was able to describe it to me, and that is, I have to, first of all, have incredible compassion for the person's problem. Number two, I have to want above anything is to solve that problem, not just give a project, uh, a diet, or, or something. I have to literally want it. And in wanting it and wanting their freedom, I have to absorb a certain degree of it, or I have to become them, and then work out the problem. There's a difference between just giving a treatment and working out a unique imbalance, a scenario, a story, whatever it was in their life, and it could be a story, it could be an injury, it could be uh, a location, it could be an association, it could be anything, and I look for that. And then at the end of the day, I'm totally satisfied I have gone where I say no man has gone because I'm involved with the condition. Now, what, that can change me over time. That could burn me out. That could... Um, make me suffer 
But the horse is an animal that doesn't lie. A dog lies. A dog will love a killer. A dog will love anything. It's like an autistic thing. And I'm not saying anything about do bad about dogs. Dogs are incredibly loving. But they're not a gauge of truth. A horse is a gauge of truth. The horse mimics back, feeds back the exact mirror image of what you are going through. And then you can see clearly what you're going through and how you do it and how you respond. You can see your fears, feel your fears through the horse. And then the horse clears it, his energy, but not just the energy, it is the, it's the mirroring back. And that's why there's equine therapy. Why, was a, why does a person who's completely screwed up touch a horse and they start changing, caring for a horse, riding a horse, and most of them don't even ride, they just care. And they still get brought out of their, their um, scenario of whatever their brain is thinking. And it, it allows them to have freedom. Well, <clears throat> I want to experience everything that a horse has, and I've never, ever seen or known anybody who knows a horse, rides a horse, uh, becomes the horse as much as Colin. And so I always say, in fact, I do more than that. I'll wear Colin's shirt. I'll wear <laughs> Colin's hat. I'll wear Colin's belt. <laughs> and I ride like him. And I've gotten to the place where I'm so much one with the horse that I'll do things that no, well, other riders would never even do. And I'm just one with the horse. And then that clears me, and I'm double, triple the energy in the office. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know how it works with the horse, but I suspect it has to do with electricity. Our brains run on electricity. Yes. Uh, and the horse has a, an electrical field that's about, uh, they say about 10 feet out from where you stand from the horse. <clears throat> and our electrical field is, they say, five or six feet. Uh, so if you are 10 feet from a horse, you have entered their electrical field. So we've got a certain uh, um, frequency happening in our brain that's driving our brain, that's driving our entire body. And so does the horse. It's got, it's got a frequency, so these frequencies get together. And uh, it's been shown that if you mix two frequencies, um, they will tend to amalgamate with each other and became, become the same frequency. And I think if you concentrate on a horse and look at the horse and, and try and feel the horse, what the horse is thinking, that's a, that's a, a, a precursor to you getting the same electrical beat. And the earth, of course, is the biggest producer of electricity there is ever. And so the horse has got four feet plugged into the earth, so it's like four plugs in an electrical circuit. So if you get on the horse, you're not, you are being consumed with the, electric, the electricity from the earth, which is coming up through the horse and absolutely invading your body unbelievably and uh, uh, mobilizing neons and it uh, goes to your pleasure center of your brain. And so mm -hmm. people get on a horse and you look at them, and I've seen it all the time and so have you. We've sometimes commented about this. Is this lady's never been on a horse before. You see the first thing that happens when they get on the horse, they start smiling. They mm -hmm. go, wow, this feels so good. Right. Well, how can it feel that good that makes them feel like that, but it does. Yes. And I think it's an internal mobilization of all this yeah. all this uh, wonderful thing that's electricity, which is coming from the earth, invades their body, takes them all over. And the trouble is I think we walk around with uh, rubber sole shoes all the time and, and uh, we are actually insulated from the earth, especially people living in multiple story complexes and stuff, they're, yes. they're not in the earth. Yes. But when you're on a horse and you touch the horse, you zap, you get zapped. Yes. It's like when two people are, when you go from a street and you walk up in a high building and you touch a doorknob, zap, and you get hit. Yes. Well, that's because the doorknob is connected by steel, which is connected to the earth. You've just, you've, you're not, you touch the doorknob when you get up there and then you get neutralized. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the same thing with yeah. the horse. Every, every condition, every emotion, Every disease has a frequency. 
There are m machines that can do this. It's been known since the <coughs> 20s and 30s. Um, there's devices, there's computers now that can register and analyze frequencies of uh, causes. Every heavy metal, every nutrient, every thought has a specific frequency. And in our lives today, these get really derailed, dismantled, disassembled. And most people feel completely disassembled from themselves by the end of the day. <coughs> and then treatments of any kind seem to help. Do people do yoga, people do whatever they can to gain back that natural feeling. But that natural feeling has been really quite lost in our world, especially with the EMF and phones, um, constantly looking at social media, TV. There's no touch with a sense of reality. They can walk on the beach, that's really good. They can take a hike, that's really good. But those would be simple things, like uh, a massage would be equivalent to a hike. It's not doing anything specific, but it does help. But there is this horse, this beast, a thousand pounds, that just happens to have this electrical thing. Um, that he's talking about it. It can be a, not necessarily electrical, it could be magnetic. <clears throat> and then that magnetic field is so strong and it is the magnetic field of the root of our balance. The balance within us, way a long time ago, maybe when you were a kid and you're out in a field and playing something or building a fort, it's that root and then it has the root of all the thousands of years that people have been riding horses and uh, all that a horse does. And the horse wants to give to us. That's what I've realized. The horse wants to impart itself and do something for us. Horse doesn't just want to be eating grass and being wild. It wants to serve man. Just like we have a purpose. We all want to serve something. Otherwise, we don't feel like we even exist or what's the, what's the use of existing. The horse does too. There's no harm in riding a horse like we do. It wants it. And then it wants to feel the change in us. You're correct about that. And you've, you said something earlier which is uh, resonating in my brain. <clears throat> that you can't lie to a horse because yes. he doesn't lie to you. A horse sees you as you are and he's figured you out. You can approach a horse and once you get within his, within his range, he looks at you. He's figured out everything about you at that moment. Before you even before you put a hand on him, he's figured out what sort of mood you're in, uh, whether you're in a hurry, whether you're slow, whether you're just casual, uh, your heartbeat. He's figured that out too. He's figured out a lot about you. But uh, the idea that you you can't lie to a horse is really something. And we've you and I have seen this. We've talked about it. Of course, we've had great conversations on the trail. That's what Ed and I do. He's mm -hmm. very very knowledgeable and very very astute at these feelings that uh, come be come between people and animals and particularly horse and people uh, <coughs> but when when I was steeple chasing for uh, steeple chase for many years and <coughs> steeple chasing is about the most dangerous thing you can do on a horse and I had so many crashes steeple chasing but so I'd always be a little bit nervous before a start of a race so I'd uh, say, well, I'm going to fix that. I don't want the horse to know I'm uh, basically afraid mm -hmm. because I've seen people get killed on races I've been in. Mm -hmm. I thought, ah, this is... So I'd take a, I'd take a, good, uh, a good token of port, about a whole glass full of port, and belt that down. Wow. And go, oh, <laughs> I feel, oh, now I feel totally good. Now I feel, I'm so brave now. And I walk up to the horse and say, <laughs> ah, look at me. And they just look at you and say, you're full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> you can't lie to them. <laughs> no. And that's why equine therapy works, because they, they, they see everything. And, and they'll mimic back to you. If you walk up to a horse angry, he'll try to bite you. If you walk up f f fearful, they won't listen to you. Uh, each each maneuver back. Now you don't even know this is happening, but it's happening. And then that magnetic field changes you until, if you're there long enough, you become a new person. 
Yeah, it's amazing. But I like the idea that um, I, I, I love writing with you because uh, uh, I can I can go to that place where I like to go, where I do feel a little fear. I think fear is a very good thing to feel, and we're we are encouraged in our, in this society not to feel any fear. In fact, not to feel any pain. If you fe- if you're feeling pain, take take some medication. If you're feeling fear, get a psychiatrist. But I think feeling fear is a very good thing. Yeah. And so when I when I get out riding with you, I'm always looking for some bad stuff to find. Yeah. And I say, well. Uh, let's go and see, and uh, and if I can if I can feel my heart miss a beat, I think, oh, that was worth it. Right there, that moment was worth. This ride was worth that moment. <laughs> worth getting up at five thirty in the morning, saddling <laughs> a couple of horses, <laughs> and doing it. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, quite quite something to go at a level. Well, we always try to go at least a nine point five out of a ten. Occasionally we'd hit a 10, but then we're really pushing it. But the, the feeling of accomplishment afterwards, because our fear says, oh, oh, we're in trouble, we're in trouble. But the horse most likely can handle it, and we can handle it. We just have to have the skill level. And to push that and to go there and then come out of it, then you realize the fear, how much fear was really real. And 99% of all people's fears aren't even real to begin with. Is just happening. So the horse guides you to new levels of being, of uh, fearlessness, which, you know, then that leads to courage. And it's not being stupid. It's it's the feeling of what you can do. Well, fear is fear is a natural reaction to danger, and it's what's kept us alive for five million years. Yes. Fear. Everybody who goes into battle fears something. You fear you're going to die. Yes. But actually fear is its very interesting what you, that you should say that. Fear is, fear is an invention uh, and because you're projecting something in the future. Well, you don't, nobody knows what's going to happen in the next one minute. So how can you project what's going to happen yes. in the next 10 or 15 just because you're getting in a, a difficult place? Yeah. That's an imagination. Uh, I have a pretty good imagination, and so that's why I feel the fear. But I always like to embrace the fear. I say, "Oh, there's my friend, the fear. Oh, thank goodness for that. Okay, mm-hmm. now I'm going to really ride because I have to really ride. Uh, I could, I could uh, crash here, and y- you and I have both ended up in hospitals doing this stuff. <laughs> 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 but you know, get out of the hospital. I think, well, it was kind of worth it. You know what I mean? Yeah. We did something. We yeah. went went to the nth degree, yeah. and uh, it's amazing. People say, I get criticised sometimes. Sometimes from people who say, "Well, what about the horse? You're endangering the horse." I say, "Not really. The horse has four legs. We only have two. We can't do what they do because they have four legs and we only have two. We'd fall over. You and I couldn't walk up or walk down most of the hills. We go up and down at a right. good clip." Yes. You know, but it's because they are endowed with four legs. Yes. We're, 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 we're pretty useless by comparison. So the, the problem, there is a natural fear, and we have to embrace that. But in today's society, it's the fear of fear. That is what's wiping everybody out. <clears throat> There's two nervous systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Parasympathetic is peace, confidence, quietude, courage. Um, You're one with the circumstance. The sympathetic is fight or flight. And now people are in fight or flight for the simplest, dumbest things you can possibly even imagine, like even going outside or a person who can't go to the market or can't drive a freeway. That's a fear of a fear. That's not reality. Okay, so nothing... um, equals a horse in balancing that vagus nerve and that parasympathetic nervous system. And today, even in my office, because people don't ride horses uh, and there's no access to horses, I'll either give them a, a, a machine that they can use at their house to balance that parasympathetic, or we do treatments. Nobody heals unless they're in parasympathetic. So whatever may, means that they do to get there, whatever form of treatment, They think that's really good, but nothing, including all my machines, all my devices, equals 
that parasympathetic of the horse having on or the horse having on the parasympathetic nervous system and bringing it back it gives you back to roots of maybe living in a village or in a little town and ancestrally and where you just were thinking about what you were doing, not about the future and whether a catastrophe was going to happen. And that is a, a, that's a thrill. When I come back from a ride with Colin, there's not anything I can't conquer after riding with him. And now I like to give him a show. I like to go out there a little faster than he's used to, a little <laughs> steeper, a little more. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> I've noticed that, but fortunately he's brought along his girlfriend, Christina, who's, uh, she's been, we've both been teaching Christina now for about three years, yeah. and uh, she has become a remarkable horsewoman. And I, I, I used to delight now that I couldn't scare Ed anymore. I'd say, well, I, this Christina, I'll be able to scare her. Well, uh, that worked for about three or four rides, and now I don't hear any, uh, no squeaking at all. She's leading the pack. She's yeah. leading us. Yeah. Oh, there I go again. I have to find another victim. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what's interesting is that you and I, well, I learned it from you, unless I had it instinctively, but you and I don't teach we have them ride with us and we only take it a hair more each time. And in doing that, in three years with almost no teaching, she has become this rider, which becomes a thrill for us because she's riding like us and then we get to re-experience our learning through her and we experience the past and the joy. And that's a remarkable thing rather than taking a class where you know every little thing what to do um, but then you don't know how to ride. Well, that's that's a very good point. Um, I think there's too much education put into riding. You know, heels down. Well, that's ridiculous, heels down. You look at any of paintings from, uh, from a thousand years ago, everybody had their heels up. Nobody had their heels down. What's that about? You know, Attila the Hun... Uh, he didn't have heels up or heels down. He just he just rode into people, rode into Romans, and cut their heads off. Um, this uh, equitation is equitation. It was actually invented by the French, which is you know so, so much for their cavalry as well. Um, they started with cavalry, and it was and out of that came dressage because you had one person on a horse approaching and uh, the enemy, and the enemy came up his head beside his horse and it was uh, bladed weapons and they started swinging swords at each other. Uh, so if you had a horse that was could move to the side quickly, uh, your enemy would extend their blade and so you'd be out of, out of reach of the blade. But if you had a good horse who was known that had dressage training, you could, with your off leg, tap him on the side and he'd move in. you flick the blade out of the way of your your side pass and then you could drive it through his heart that was the whole idea of dressage and it worked very well of course as usual everything works until something else changes and the bullet came along and that ended all that fancy mm. stuff <laughs> they, they kept up kept up with oh. dressage and i think you know dressage is a it's a discipline but it's that's all it is it's a discipline a discipline, but there are many other disciplines. I like the way uh, you and I ride, which takes everything to another level, and it it, it uh, quickly gets to a point where you where you think, "Wow, well, that's that's a bad looking that's a bad looking hill, that's a bad looking ditch." But we got great horses, and that's another thing that we've done together mm -hmm. is we've um, we've turned ordinary horses into great mountain horses. Th these horses can do anything we have the courage to do because they've learned their skills just like we have. Yeah. So it's a parallel learning experience. Yes. And what's great about that, if you're in tune, is you realize the horse is proud of what he has learned to do. He's proud of it. He wants to go out and journey with you. He want, The ride is not that we're burdening him with the ride. We're including him, and it is including us on something it wants to do and experience and become even braver. It's like a life experience for him 
<clears throat> that the wild can't offer. And when a horse experiences that, they want nothing more than that. That's what they want. Well, when you see horses at play, they're, they're doing it at the gallop. They're chasing each other, kicking up their feet. They're doing lots of things, yeah. and it's lots of movement. Whereas uh, a lot of way modern riding seems to have um, shrunk down to arena riding, which is absolutely ridiculous, the people riding in circles. Yeah. I don't understand that at all. Riding in circles? No horse in the wild goes in a circle. They yeah. don't. Yes. I've been. I've spent lots of times with wild horses in Australia, and they all run in straight lines. Yes. None of them go in a circle. No. But yet we uh, spend all our time trying to get horses going in yes. circles around arenas. What that is about, I cannot understand. Well, I know in my practice, I see a lot of people get injured on horses. They come in from falls or crashes and so forth. And I would say eighty to nine percent of the falls happen in an arena. It didn't happen out on a trail. Um, the horses are super anxious in an arena. They're not calm. They're not enjoying themselves. They're kind of irritated. They don't want to do whatever they're doing. And then they'll cause a mistake. What Colin has taught me is that, first of all, you have to have absolutely the best equipment. And if you want to really ride, there's only one equipment, and that's Australian gear because it was made for practicality, it wasn't made for looks. Two, uh, you, you have to have a natural position, not a, a mentally attuned position, a natural position where you're one with the horse. And that just happens because of the equipment and because of a touch of experience, um, not experience but learning, just a touch, and not trying to do anything, you will fall into that position of being one with the horse, and oh my gosh, heels up, leaning forward, your head down with the head of the horse, the hands by the jaw. Um, it's like Avatar. It's no different than the movie Avatar and when they rode those creatures in the movie. That is when you're there and you're totally balanced. And very, well, Colin is the master of that, and he brought it from the outback. And I'm so fortunate to have been able to experience that. Again, he didn't teach me how to do it. He, he just said, stay on the horse. <laughs> and <laughs> your body will automatically go to the position to stay on the horse. <laughs> if you're not in position, you're not on the horse. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, just the thrill of the horses. There's no other animal that can give us that thrill. No, no right, other animal. Right. I don't care what animal you're talking about. It just doesn't work. Because the horse is a noble creature. It's been around a long time. It's been around 50 million years. Uh, came out of the swamps, they say. And we're, we are said to be 5 million years old, which I don't know about that either. But um, the fact is we were in trees or in caves or wherever the hell we were, but the horse was running around. It was... Uh, it uh, doesn't have uh, it doesn't have teeth to rip things apart, rip anim other animals apart. It's it's got a very good kick in it, that's for sure. But um, that's all not very not very good equipment for killing, as like a tiger or a lion has. They can rip flesh easily. Horse can't do that. But what the horse got was interestingly is speed, and speed is its natural thing. People say you shouldn't gallop horses. I say you should always gallop a horse. Whenever you can, gallop a horse because that releases them from their, from their boredom, from their, their ordinariness. And they want to, as, as you've often pointed out, they want to serve us. Yeah. They want to feel, wow. And they can feel the thrill we get out of it. And th that's transmitted to them. And they go, wow. He's he's enjoying this. Yes. Oh wow, I'm enjoying it too. So we're both enjoying yeah, it yeah. together. Let's let's yeah. hit it. <laughs> we have a, uh, a well, our our way of riding. I don't know what it's called, but it, as soon as we hit the trail, maybe from the highway, we have to cross many highways. But as soon as we hit the trail, it's all out blast because that's what the horse wants to do. And the horse will run full speed until it can't run full speed. And then it's settled. It's got to, it's like giving a child 
fun before you ask them to do some work. And although we've never talked about it, that's exactly what we do. We let that horse have all the fun it can have in the first five, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, and then we ask it to do work. And that's so exciting. And um, I learned something else, not that Colin taught me it, but he put me into the position to realize it. I didn't know how to buy a horse. It's impossible. So Colin would buy a horse. And I remember his first horse he bought me. And I said, well, is he safe? Oh, yeah. Well, don't worry about it. I said, well, who owned it last? Oh, oh. well, he's the best rider, even maybe better than you. And, and I said, well, what happened to him? Why is he getting it? Oh, he was thrown. Oh. <laughs> so I'm sitting there. Now my fear is starting to come up. <laughs> Am I going to tell Colin I'm not going to ride the horse? Well, first of all, I'm never say no to Colin. <laughs> so I learned something that day. You can talk to horses. You can literally talk to them if you're honest. I went up to the horse. I said, I promise you, I will give you the best life you ever had, the most fun, the most daring. You will experience one with me. I'll experience one with you. If you don't throw me, <laughs> and, uh, and we will be together. Oh my gosh! From that day, well, the first time I got on, he became like you. You were completely astounded. That was Quattro. Quattro yeah. became the super horse. Could do anything. Never ever did he cause anything that he had caused anybody else before me. <laughs> and I learned to talk to horses. And, and <laughs> yeah, I certainly remember, certainly remember Quattro. The f first time I, first time I rode him, my, my first thought was not how good he was. I thought, well, I'm glad Ed's riding this horse, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I have this knack. I can take pretty bad horses. Um, Colin, um, I he bought a horse that. Well, it was maybe way above my level, uh, but I just had a gut feeling. I said, I'll, tr I'll trade your horse. And I took his horse, which was really kind of misbehaving horse, and we did a trade. And that horse became the best riding horse on the mountain with me. And I, I had a different way of communicating with him. And then that made me feel better, and I think I made it feel better. Uh, yeah, that was the horse I had basically given up riding. Because uh, it was, you know, it, it uh, bucked all the time. Well, while I enjoy a good buck, it was okay, but seemed like a bit irritating after a while. And yeah. sure enough, Ed comes along, and uh, you came along, and and uh, that horse just loves you to death. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I approach the horse, and he is flat back. <laughs> you you go up, and it's like, oh, hello, hi, how are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's uh, the relationship with the mm -hmm. horses. But it's. Uh, when you look at history, it's uh, uh, the history of the horse and the history of humans, uh, our relationship with the horse, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, um, the Samaritan women warriors uh, 2,000 years ago were the first horse people to actually have us to ride the horse into battle. Uh, and they were, they were ferocious women, um, said to have come from the Amazonian somewhere along. And uh, they were pretty good uh, and uh, um, then the Huns uh, the Huns tried to knock them out but couldn't and meanwhile the Huns were fighting the Romans at that time and uh, the Romans rode bareback for the uh, and there was a Roman law that said you couldn't have a saddle on the horse you couldn't have anything between your backside and the horse mm. uh, other than a blanket other than some sort of uh, uh, the cloth covering, you couldn't have anything solid, um, which uh, even then the Romans knew about that energy from the horse coming from the earth and they didn't want anything to interrupt that energy coming up. And uh, uh, of course their biggest uh, nemesis was Attila the Hun at, uh, at that point and Attila was the first one to use a saddle in battle and he he devised a saddle 
that spread the weight of the rider over a greater area of the back, therefore lowered its pounds per square inch. So he could now, he, the Romans were very, very good with that short sword, and uh, uh, the Huns were swinging big axes and big swords and whatever the el else they could do to chop into somebody. Um, but, uh, uh, and the, it would always end up with the Romans catching the Huns and, and everybody, you can only gallop a horse for three miles and that's it. You get off the horse, its back's gone. Uh, and that still exists pretty much today unless we have a good saddle. Uh, you can ride them for longer then. But bareback, three, three miles and you're, they're done, bareback. So the, the Romans and the Huns always would meet together after three miles and there'd be a sword fight. Mm. And uh, the Romans would knock the Huns out all the time. But mm. then Attila got the idea to build a saddle. Oh. And thereafter that, he, were, he made the first saddle for battle, the first real saddle. Uh, the Samaritan Women Warriors had something before, and the, the Chinese had something even before that, but it was a mounting saddle. The Chinese had the stirrups, and they'd just lower one stirrup and climb up on that, mm. and on this contraption they had there. <coughs> but uh, because Attila invented that saddle, he beat the Roman Empire. And once he went into battle again and didn't have to fight him sword to sword, a toe to toe, he could just, uh, they would chase after him and uh, at three miles, Attila would keep going because he had a saddle to disperse, mm. disperse the weight of the rider over a greater distance and the horse wouldn't get a sore back. Wow. And he'd just circle around and cut off the front, cut off the back, cut off the sides and then rain down arrows. He never lost another battle. Wow. And the saddle made that possible. Wow, I'm aware of that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and and in in the bush in Australia, where I'm from, of course, and um, saddle saddle was everything. Yeah. How good how good was a saddle? And we we never rope anything in Australia. We chase everything to ground, and uh, mm -hmm. you got you got uh, there's no no bullock alive. We call them bullocks. You call them cows, but we call them bullocks. No bullock alive that can outrun a horse. Horse can outrun them all. Mm -hmm. So we just chase them until they get exhausted, come up beside them, grab their tail, swing to the right, swing to the left, swing to the left mostly, and trip them over, fly off the horse, and then uh, we have bull belts, which you wear like bandolier style, and strap their back legs, and, and they have a horn saw, reach forward, cut their horns off, reach back, we've got a castration knife on our, on our belts, and reach forward, zap, zap, knock the balls off, and there you have a bullock pretty much under control and then you get behind a tree and they'll charge your horse but they got no horns and I can hurt the horse and horses know to get out of the way anyhow mm. wow. <laughs> different style <laughs> but that's where I learned to ride yeah yeah well um, riding well for instance my saddle that you gave me it's 40 years old and it's like brand new it's one with my body. It's like no English saddle. It's like nothing. It's, it is literally the perfect saddle. I can ride all day long. I want to be in the saddle. The saddle itself heals me um, because it's uh, made for practicality and made to feel the horse, not be on top commanding a horse. Yeah, what's interesting about the Australian saddle, we're looking at one here. Uh, what's interesting about it is it was... Uh, um, started out as a dressage saddle when Australia was first uh, settled and um, it was a penal colony then and uh, just um, ships would come with all the, all the uh, convicts from England and these convicts had stolen, stolen a loaf of bread from the land of gentry or some ridiculous mm. crime like that and they loaded them in, they land them in Australia where much to the amusement of the Aboriginals, these strange white people arrived and they started building big stone houses in which they put themselves behind bars. The Aboriginals couldn't figure that out. Why are these people coming here to live in those stupid oh, places? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the guards had a dressage saddle and uh, uh, an escaped convict, if he was lucky, would grab a horse and grab a saddle and gallop out in the bush and and have to be have to be caught if it, and they took a lot of catching uh, but they started sewing then the hunks of leather to the leading edge of the saddle which kept them in at the gallop mm. and that's where that knee pad came from 
It's still called a knee pad, although it's up on the thigh now. Mm. And it uh, fits the Australian style of riding, which is fast and furious on rough country. And your horse will crash once or twice every day. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, um, in that rugged environment, it's rugged for people as well as horses. It, yeah, it's pretty tough on horses, but pretty tough on people too. Mm. Well. well, I've had some big crashes myself. I think it was all due to my fault, but um, now I don't have so many. I don't. I haven't had one in two years, uh, maybe a year. <laughs> 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 one thing about Colin, maybe it's this Australian thing. Um, in America, oh, run to you and what can I do? What what's happened? You're okay. I'll call the hospital. And he just sits there and looks at you, <laughs> and <laughs> and you slowly get up. <laughs> and you slowly climb on the uh, the horse, and <clears throat> I've had my horse literally do a 360 tumble and land on me, laying on my belly, um, <clears throat> thinking I was crushed, but I wasn't. Uh, broken ribs, thinking my back's broken, but he just waits for you to get on that horse and get back up, and you ride home, and then you get on the next day, and whatever it is, and you you find out that you don't have to be afraid of those crashes and you don't have to quit riding. You get better and better and pretty soon you don't crash and the, and you understand the horse better and better. I remember one one spectacular crash you had. We were gallop up, up on a ridge up there. We got a good canter going and, and uh, you went down a, a nasty hole on the left and you crashed down there and ro the horse rolled over and and you, you, and I saw saw you down there, and I thought, wow, he looks halfway okay. And uh, then you crawled up to the top of the bank, and I, I got your horse, and and uh, you looked okay. You were walking okay, and and uh, he, you said, wow, I didn't expect that. And I said, you know, that's interesting. That ditch, I did exactly the same two weeks ago. <laughs> you said you didn't even tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a uh, a very very hairy. <laughs> thing on the side of a mountain two foot trail on the side of a, a mountain with uh, something you had to j jump well my horse could probably jump it but that day we had already run for two hours and that horse didn't have the energy to jump it but I didn't know it I wasn't in tune and so we went backwards when he hit the wall fell backwards and I went down into a gully <laughs> but that doesn't happen anymore. I'm so in tune with what she's capable of. I don't ask her to do that if she's exhausted. And yeah, that's one thing uh, you've got you got better at than I have is gauging what gas is left in the horse. Yeah. I tend not to look at the gas meter, and you should do. And uh, riding with you has taught me taught me something mm -hmm. too. You're very sensitive to what the horse can take. And uh, you say, no, we shouldn't do that. Uh, they don't have enough gas. We'll do it. We'll do it next time we come out. We'll, we'll, we'll go straight to it and do it then so they'll have the gas. And that's something I never thought of yeah. uh, to the extent that you do. Yeah. Uh, you know, to me, an exhausted horse is something that falls on the ground and you <laughs> you get up and it's yeah, still laying yeah. on the ground. That to yeah. me is exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> We've had so many experiences where... Colin says, we're going to go explore that canyon. And I says, probably nobody's ever walked it in history or maybe 500 years ago, rugged, no trails. And I'll go, Colin, I know we can get down there, but there's no way we're coming up. <laughs> and they are too tired. Well, now, it, now Colin listens. <laughs> and they'll say, you're right, we'll do it when we haven't already torn all the mountains apart. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's just a great thing, and, uh, and like you say, with now riding with your girlfriend Christina, who you going to get married? It's yes, you, you yes. Ed proposed to Christina out on the trail, right out there, where it was a good thing to do, yeah. and uh, uh, she's become a magnificent rider, and it's just such a joy. It's uh, uh, because it's a repeat of what I saw you go through, and indeed I. I went through the same thing, but so long ago, I don't yeah, know when yeah. it was. But um, I still like that. I still like that feeling of, is it possible? I like mm -hmm. to look at something and say, 
do you think a horse can a horse get down there? And <laughs> your reply is, yeah, we can get down there. Can we get back? <laughs> oh, that that can be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing you've taught me, I might have taught you a lot, but you've taught me to be more horse sensitive yeah. about what they're capable of and look at look at the gas meter and see what gas they got left. Yeah. And yeah. That's a very good thing that, that I've learned. I have one uh, <coughs> patient, immense emotional, spiritual, some physical uh, problems in her 70s, lives in Colorado, and uh, she comes out twice a year for treatment. And this last time, her problems were of certain type. And I said, you know, I know you can't ride a horse. And it's not going to happen. But I tell you what, if you want to be healed and go to the next level, are there any horses where you drive or do you go, oh, yeah, there's a ranch. And their horses are always by the field, by the, by the, uh, the wood fence. And I said, just stop. Feed them some carrots. Just touch them. Just stand next to them. I guarantee it will change your life, change your health. And a month later, she called and she says, it's been the most amazing thing you can possibly believe. I stop whenever I'm on that road. I get out. I spend a few minutes. The horses kind of wander up. She doesn't do anything with the horses, but it completely transforms her and heals her. And she's a different person. Yeah, that's, well, that's, uh, that's, you know, I've had, I've had experiences similar to that with horses. Uh, um, you know, I, uh, I had a major crash on a horse that had uh, <coughs> something wrong with its head. It had a bad smash on its head, and it had what they call the wobbles. Mm -hmm. You remember that horse? Yes. And uh, uh, he he bu he exploded. He was shaking his head when I was out in the trail, uh, and he exploded and. Uh, reared up and spun around, and that's the last thing I remember. Next thing I remember, I'm, I'm in, I'm looking up, and there's a guy looking down at me, and I said, "Who, who are you?" And he said, "I'm the emergency room doctor." He said, "You've had a bad accident, a bad horse fall." I said, "Well, I'm out of here. I feel great, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he turned his back, I ran out of the hospital. <laughs> but I wasn't too good for about. Uh, a week. I, I should have stayed there on second thoughts, but I wasn't speaking right and I wasn't walking right. And then, uh, but anyhow, that horse uh, couldn't sell it, didn't want to sell it to anybody. So the horse moved on to the happy hunting grounds. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that happened, but I heard, not by anybody you know, but I heard from somebody driving through the canyon there was a horse racing up and down Canaan on the boulevard at full speed. Uh, wrecking all all the transportation and everything, and I went, oh my gosh, I know that's Colin. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got in my car, I drove as fast as I could. It took nine police to stop that horse from running on the highway, and luckily one of the policemen was a horseman. And he brought that horse up, I took him, he gave it to me, because uh, he knew I could handle the horse. And I calmed it down, uh, but that horse literally ran about three miles full speed on highway, falling over, blocking traffic, and uh, after he crashed you. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm unconscious and out there in the jungle someplace. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I, m I remember the when I was a kid, I was about six years old, I guess, and up in the cattle property, there's this old guy called Fernley, and... Uh, I admired Fernley because he could really handle a horse. He, so I said to Fernley one day, can I go out with you and we'll chase these cattle? He says, yeah, but you've got to do everything I say. I don't want you running off and doing stuff. And I said, yeah, you're fine. I'll, I'll behave myself. Well, I could behave myself for about an hour, I guess, and then I behavior got a little bit difficult to handle. And I saw a, a, a really nice slope uh, like no, it wasn't perpendicular. It was pretty close down to down to a river down there, and I thought that's it. I'm going to go down there. Fernley saw me looking at it, and he looked at me and he says, "No," and I says, "Okay." So as soon as he turned away, I, I pulled to the right and went screaming down that hill on that horse. Mm. 
well, I'm flying down and going down as fast as I can. And it was so exhilarating. But then next thing I know, it's a hell of a crash. And I'm on the ground and the horse had rolled over. And, but it rolled over on top of me, but it, it was not staying there because it was a, a, a very steep cliff. And, uh, and uh, the, everything got very still. And the horse was flipping its head a bit. And I looked down and there was a white bone sticking out of its back leg mm. and had broken its leg mm. and uh i was terrified i look up at fernley he's up on the up on the top of the ridge there rolling rolling a cigarette as usual and i says fernley my horse is down he says i can see that <laughs> and he said i said well what'll i do it's got a broken leg and he's rolling his smoke rolling his cigarette and he lights a, lights it up and blows smoke in the air and he says, cut its throat. I said, cut its throat? I've never done that before. Well, do it. That's what you got to do. Can't have the horse in pain. We don't have any guns. You got to cut its throat. But before you do that, takes another, cig takes another draw on his cigarette and he says, but before you do that, Take that horse's head in your hand and pat the horse nicely on his forehead. You got that? Takes another drag in his cigarette. I said, yeah, well, I find my knife and he says, and then tell the horse that you're sorry that he's in this situation. Take blame for it. You ran that horse down that hill like an idiot. He's the smart one. You're the idiot. Now cut its throat and tell the horse you're sorry. Okay? Mm. I thought about that and took a big breath. Mm. You know, I've never run down a hill since unless I remember that. Mm. I remember that really so well. Mm. It was my, I was an idiot. Yeah. I took the horse beyond its limit yeah. just for my own ego. And that's a mistake. Yeah. I think that's a mistake a lot of horsemen make. Yeah. You've got to know what the horse can handle. You've got to know what you can handle. And you've got to know what's going to happen if it goes wrong. And ever since then, if I gallop down a hill, which I do a lot of, and we do it together, I'm looking, where am I going to land? Where's this horse going to roll if it goes down? You don't want to be where there's rocks and bad stuff. You want to... You want to be if it if it happens. So yeah. I've always thought of that. I've never ever gone down a hill unless I think of that. Mm. Well, I I didn't know that that's what you're kind of supposed to do, but I did that naturally. Every time you and me get on a really steep hill, I am analyzing constantly where am I going to fall. I am pre prepared. I thought I was just a chicken and figuring that out, but now just talking <laughs> to you, I realize <laughs> that's being smart. <laughs> well, uh, the last, about four, four months ago, we were going down the hill, very steep, almost the, the rump of the horses on the ground. We call it the wall. Uh, nobody ever even walks on this hill. And I get down at kind of most of the way down, and I hear him yell, and I turn around real fast and look up. And he is flying over the head of the horse, like ejected. <laughs> <laughs> and in my mind, it's like Superman jumping off the end of a building. Arms fling his head, a big smile as he's flying <laughs> over the horse's head. And the horse is, I don't even know if the horse went down, but he went off. And I thought, oh my God, horse is going to step on him, this and that. But he, I guess he had pre-planned his fall by thinking ahead of time and I got there and Colin was fine. He did some kind of roll. He landed in a giant pile of bushes so he didn't really hit the ground that hard and then that worked. That, that what you said worked. But <laughs> I learned something today because I'm thinking that all the time expecting to go down and I just thought I was a fearful guy but maybe I'm preparing myself for the possibility. <laughs> Well, like they say, the good thing is uh, r r never ride alone. Ride with your fear, mm -hmm. but keep it, un keep it in check. Yeah. Your fear is your friend. Yeah. Keep it in check. Yeah. And increase speed, find the steep hill, 
and go for it. So, Ed, where can people find you? Well, I'm in Pacific Palisades, right on the corner of uh, P PCH and Sunset Boulevard. I've been in practice 47 years, so there's almost nothing I haven't seen. Uh, we cover almost every condition you can imagine. The address is 17383 West Sunset Boulevard, Pacific Palisades. Phone number is 310-230-2145. And if anybody has any problem that nothing has worked, nothing at all, no matter where they went, with the 47 years of experience and all the studies and my crew, we almost always figure out what's going on. And we work on the cause rather than just doing therapy. We try to eliminate, understand the cause. And we have a remarkable um, history of people getting better from unheard of things. And I can attest to that when I get off horse these days, being approaching 82. I'm sometimes a little stiff. Mm -hmm. I've had nine concussions, so I guess that's got something to do with it. Uh, I've hit the ground quite a few times, one way or the other, been rolled on and, and haven't been kicked though. Horses don't seem to kick me, but they will roll on me. <laughs> and uh, Ed, after ride, always puts his hand on me somewhere. And uh, it's got a, a wonderful couple of gizmos. And, and I always get up from that after five minutes, and I feel great. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, that's Ed Wagner, world-famous uh, uh, healer. And... Uh, and a fearless rider. Thanks for joining me over 30 years riding like hell. And uh, thank you for being here today, Ed. And you're, you're on uh, in the Colin Dangard show, and thank you. Before there was time, beyond time and space, a pleasure.